Okay, so last class we started talking about what is a micro about a microarray. Um, what is a microarray? The important thing is that it's a uh, technology for. Uh, it, it, there are lots of different problems you can solve using microarrays it's, it's in, 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 in the laboratory. That's the first order of business. It's to notice that microwave rays emerged, I will say, about 10 years ago. And they really changed the business of how you assess, um, how, how you do a lot of different kinds of experiments. Because a lot of experiments that you used to be able to do, one laboratory experiment to find out about one gene, okay, and some level. Now you could find out about all the genes in one experiment and in one, you know, at, at quite a reasonable cost. And this changed the picture of how you do things. Okay, um, so what is the basic idea of these things? Again, I talked about them a little bit. How did they work? The way to think about them is that they are single-stranded um, DNA or RNA molecules that are anchored with one end to a plate. So this is a plate. Okay, that's what I would like to do in my drawing. And we've got molecules that are, atta that are attached, one end nailed down to the plate. Okay, and the other's floating around like I want to say like hair or seaweed, something like this. Okay, and these molecules are all, we'll call DNA, all out of DNA, and they are designed to be in basically patches where in each patch, the molecules in the hair are unique. Okay, A, C, T, T. This might be the G, A, A, T patch. Okay, and these, these molecules are sort of grown, okay, or planted. We'll talk a little bit about how they get there. But the important point is that there are small patches of molecules, each of which basically is tethered on the plate. Because we know that DNA slash RNA wants to bind to its complementary, the reverse, the complementary strand, if we prepare a target, okay, uh, uh, here's a, a, a test tube of target, where here we have a lot of DNA or RNA, let's, let's say DNA, okay, from a, uh, you know, a particular reaction, maybe extracted from a cells of a particular type, Okay, if we take this DNA, chop it into pieces, radio label, okay, or fluorescently label these pieces, and now pour this gook, okay, over the microarray, what we would expect to have happen is that whenever there was a piece of, of DNA in the target that was rever the reverse complement of something nailed down to the plate, it would bind and it would stick. Does everybody get that idea? And because these things are radio labeled or fluorescently labeled, okay, they would be a way of detecting based on the light that they give off or something that they, some signal that they will give off so you can look at this patch, this, this, this portion of the array and see it light up, okay? The more something lights up, the more stuff is hybridized to it. Does that make sense? And so if you now want to say, how much is a particular gene turned on? Well, turning on a gene made a lot of messenger RNA, right? That was sort of what we had this idea of, right? Maybe what would happen is if we extracted all the messenger RNA, okay, and radio labeled it, the genes that were turned on, those patches, the, if, if the target, if the array, okay, hairs, are associated with a substring of that gene, but not any of the other genes, we would expect that this sample is only going to stick to that region. Does that kind of make sense? By designing what we put on the microarray, when we build the microarray, we can build the probes here that will detect whether or not a particular gene product is being made, right? Our goal for what these, these hairs should be is they should be of the property that they are reverse complement of something that we're looking for. 
and ideally also only the reverse complement of what we're looking for, not a sequence that appears anywhere else in the gene in the genome. Does that make sense? And if so, then the hope would be that only the molecules that are from that will stick over where we want it to. And based by how much light we observe, then we will be able to tell whether or not that product is there. Any questions about that basic scheme? Okay. Any questions? Yes. What is the size of each strand? Okay. The answer is going to depend upon how the strands got there. Okay. There are two basic ways you might be, there's actually now several ways you can make these arrays. Okay. The basic ways that I'll, I'll say is there are, um, actually I'll probably talk about it later. Let me talk about it now, and then maybe I'll review it later, just to double check. Because I find the, the question of how you make these things interesting. It's just like the way that you, know, you, have it, you guys have your laptop, right? In there, there's this thing from Intel that is, you know, costs you know, a certain number of hundred dollars that is this amazing piece of technology. It's got millions of things on it, right? And how you make that is interesting, okay, at least to me, right? How do you make one of these arrays? There are two different ways you could make it, and that'll get to the question of how long the probes are. One way you can make them is by using basically what they call, basically if you have a test tube of stuff, you could imagine a finger or a robot reaching in, putting its finger in the test tube of stuff and then putting a drop on a piece of glass, right? This would be basically taking DNA from a sample and then putting a tiny spot down on a piece of glass, okay? In which case these probes can be as long as the DNA is in that test tube. Does that make sense? So if let's say you have um, some DNA that you think is interesting, maybe corresponding to a particular gene, right? How could you make a, a, a test tube full of DNA corresponding to a particular gene? PCR, good answer, right? You could take, let's say, one original genome level DNA, right? You feed it the primers, you amplify it, right? That one gene will get amplified and amplified. You could imagine reaching in, putting a drop of that on a slide, right? And now you've got a big piece of DNA on a slide, right? And the secret to making it a microarray is to make sure you put very small dots, okay? Any questions about that? So here, in fact, is one of those kinds of arrays. This is a piece of glass, okay? Does everybody see a piece of glass, right? This has something like about 5,000 spots on it. If you hold it up to the light, you won't see them. Okay, because these spots are very, very small. Then put down by a robot, right? And but but once you put down a tiny drop here, you can have relatively long pieces of DNA as long as you can PCR amplify. So a couple thousand, you know, a couple thousand bases seems like a reasonable thing, and that might be the size of your probes with this kind. Does that make sense? I'll pass this around. You can hold it up by the edge, look it up to the light, and you'll see nothing. Okay, <laughs> but 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 uh, you, you want anyone who wants me to pass it around? Okay, <laughs> you want to see it? Okay, here. Uh, okay, here. You can look at, hold it up. You can testify for the whole class that you see nothing. <laughs> see that nothing? What do you see through that? My fingerprint, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone want to check? Okay. Actually. Um, that's one way to do it. Actually, that's not quite actually the way this was made. This was actually made in a slightly different way, to be honest with you, as I see by the barcode on it. The other way to make these things, okay, one would be to use a spotting robot. Another way to make it, okay, would be to synthesize it. And this is actually uh, by far the more interesting way to do it. Okay, let's actually, th and we'll talk about that. Um, I'm going to keep moving around my slides a lot. So there's another class of arrays that are the ones that, like the ones I passed out last time, these affymetrics arrays, that are made by a synthesis procedure, okay, that they're going to grow the molecules to specification. What you could do is, remember how we talked about how DNA got synthesized in the first place? There was sort of, if you wanted to synthesize a molecule to specification, what could you do? 
If you have these um, molecules with a cap on it, right, what you could do is to knock the cap off and then pour over it a series of nucleotides that were basically like, like blocks that had the base that you want, it had another cap on one end, and on the end like this, it could bind to that. Does everybody see that? So basically, if you have the ability to do two kinds of steps, one of which is to knock a cap off, the other of which is to pour over a, a new set of bases of a particular type, you could grow molecules to specification. Does everybody get that idea? So what you could do now is, and this is kind of an interesting thing, suppose let's say you took your glass plate, okay, and you told it here, everything in this region of the plate, knock the cap off, okay, and then you pour over it your A's, right? These A's are going to want to bind to something. The only place where they will bind are the places where the caps got knocked off. Does everybody get that idea? You can't bind two of them because there's a cap on the other end of the base, right? So the secret to programming one of these things really becomes, how can I take my array, my piece of glass, and knock the caps off, okay, in certain spots on the array? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, there's an amazing um, photosensitive technology that this company called Affymetrix has, where what they will do is they will use light to knock the the caps off of these things, okay? So you, what you kind of imagine is just like we have up there this over projector that is shining light on the board, right? You'll note that there's some places where it is shining dark, and in some places it's shining light. Does that make sense? You could imagine if I put up a slide that was a checkerboard of where you want light and where you want dark, okay? And then I do something that says, knock off the, 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 the caps where it's light, okay? Then the caps would be knocked off, and I can now program my chip, basically, by rounds of flash up a slide, knock off, a, knock off the bases where it's light, wash over the, not like the caps where it's light, wash over everything with an A, let everything settle, put up a different light, knock off the caps of every place where it's light, wash over everything with a C. Yeah? How do you get rid of the caps, the, the, the bases with the caps that didn't stick? How do I get rid of the bases with the caps that didn't stick? I guess I wash it off. That would be my, you know, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing this for a living, but in principle I have this vision, I can wash it off. And okay? You wash off whatever you have on I shouldn't wash off the other stuff because it's bound, right? So Otherwise you've got just these things in solution. Unless it's bound and nailed to the molecule that's tethered to the plate, it would get washed oh, off. Right, right. So what I have here is, remember, that I'm, I have to prepare my plate originally with, you know, something to tether, okay, right? But that just has a cap. And once I start with this, then by successive rounds of shine a light on it, knock things off, okay, I, I, I can go and manufacture my molecules to specification. Does everybody agree with that? Now what is the manufacturing time of this thing? You were asking me how long these things were. If you think about it, if I now want to build an array of strings of length 25, how many rounds of shine light knock something off do I have to do? Say to 25, not 25. Probably four times 25-ish, right? Because in each spot I'm going to want to put an A, a C, a G, or a T, right? And so it means something like about 100 manufacturing rounds. So the point is that the number of rounds, th th to make one of these bigger, every time I decide to make it bigger, it costs me more in terms of manufacturing rounds, right? And every time I do this, there's always a chance there's a mistake, right? I don't always, when I shine a light on it, I don't always knock a cap off, right? In which case a base might not get incorporated properly. Maybe I knock off 99% of the bases, right? 
But by the time I get to 25, only about half the molecules will be right. Okay? So the bottom line is this technology is great because it lets me build, um, you know, what you call it, sequence of patterns to specification of length about 25. Okay? And if I do these things right, not with an, o not with an overhead projector like this, but the kind of photolithography tools that they use in making VLSI circuits, right? How do they make VLSI circuits? It's kind of, you have this, I mean, if you know about these things, you know, they use these masks and they use these etching in silicon and, you know, and how does the etching in silicon work? Basically, it's a similar kind of thing. They use photoresist, right? That you, you, you'll, you'll shine a light and where the light go, where, where the light signs, maybe the uh, photoresist will get etched away. Then you pour acid over the thing, and it eats down a layer. Okay, this is the kind of thing they do in manufacturing VLSI chips. And so, similarly, with similar technology, you can have the amazing thing that you can make hundreds of thousands or millions, I suspect, billions these days of different probes here. Okay, on a little glass chip like this. This is the this is one of these affymetric rays that we talked about before. Okay. And so the amazing thing is with one of these, you get something like, okay, hundreds of thousands or millions of probes, okay, each of length about 25, and one of these things will cost about $500. That's kind of the way that this would be. Okay, yeah. What's VLSI? VL, okay, VLSI. VLSI, how many people have heard the term VLSI? How many people have not heard the term VLSI? What? The reason I'm laughing at this is, of course, that there was a. T the reason why <coughs> you don't know it is because we're beyond VLSI. Okay, back in my day, when people first discovered integrated circuits, okay, VLSI stood for very large scale integration. Right? This was at the time when they were putting thousands of transistors on any chip. Okay, and then they started just kept. Remember this Moore's law thing, right? They keep putting more and more chips on density. So when I was going to grad school, people talked about VLSI chips with thousands of transistors. How many transistors are there on your Pentium now? Millions, Millions billions, right? What are they going to call that? Very, very large scale? <laughs> very, very, eventually, I guess they gave up with it. So basically, what it meant was the idea that <coughs> there was at a time a difference between the scale of stuff, of integration you would use to build a processor and what you would do to build uh, a quad input NAND gate or something like that, a very low scale integrated circuit. So that's what VLSI was. Okay? Yeah. 25 is the length of each hair, right? Or each probe would be the right. Okay, so how many, what you're saying is how big a patch of hair is this? Okay? Well, the answer is. I will say on the order of millions, because molecules are small. Remember, molecules are very small, okay? So if I have this piece of glass that is, you know, um, you know, half an inch by a half an inch, right? I put a million things on it. How much is a million, the square root of a million? Okay, 30,000 or something like that, is that right? 1,000, okay, big deal, 1,000. Okay, a one thousand, you know, one one thousandth of an inch by one one thousandth of an inch, you can park an awful lot of molecules in there, right? So think of it as being that you still have millions of molecules, each of which is a 25 mer. And these thousands of probes, you mean, thousands of patches, right? So think of it as being if you looked at this under, you know, under what I will say the microscope is. You would expect to see that here, if you look at this chip over here, there's that shiny part that's covered with glass, right? In that, there is one of these probes. This is about half, this looks like it's probably about a half inch by half inch. You would see a pattern of a thousand dots by a thousand dots, each dot of which would be molecules that are the same, okay? Each, um, Patch of which consists of millions of molecules. Okay? Any questions? Do you have any corrections or complaints about anything I'm saying? More than a thousand. <laughs> so these are like, these cover the whole yeast genome. So it's 
it's like if you take the, if you keep the whole east genome from yeah. start to finish yeah uh, these are 25 words covering the whole genome yeah so what it was saying here is that he's saying is that there's more there's not thousands of probes there's millions of probes yeah. right right no the thousands there's millions of probes in these things the thousands are the dimension squared to get a million a million would be a thousand by a thousand is what you decided right so he's saying no I can do 20,000 by 20,000 okay or, but again, if you're thinking about this like an, Ill, an integrated circuit, this isn't such an amazing thing, right? You look into your Pentium, right? That's a little half-by-half-inch piece of silicon, too. And if you zoom in here, there is one transistor dealing with your division. Well, somewhere in there, in the midst of it, in the 13th bit of your division chip, there is a transistor there that consists of many thousands of molecules, right? And they make manufacture it well enough that your division works, right? And it works reliably, okay? So that's kind of the same model to be thinking about here. Any questions about that? So the amazing thing is that if you can do these things, these are a lot like, think of them like Pentiums, okay? Um, how much does it cost to make one Pentium chip if you're Intel? They have a new, I don't know if a Pentium is probably now old fashioned to you. What's the newest chip they have out there? What? I7 core. I7 core. Suppose somebody comes out with the I8 core. How much is it going to cost Intel to make one of the I8 core? Billions, right? But to make what, the second one will cost nothing, right? Two dollars, okay? To make the third one, two dollars. And that's a similar model as here. There is a lot of design cost. There is a lot of building these masks. <clears throat> that was historically what I understood was the cost limit of these things. But so if you want to make a chip that's going to um, encode many, many, that's going to be of useful to lots of people, that people, a lot of people will buy $500 at a pop, Affymetrix would make one like this, right? Any questions about that? Okay. Yeah. So they make, if you go to the Affymetrix, you can go to their catalog. You say you want to know what does Affymetrix sell you. They will sell you, they will have a catalog of popular gene chips, right? He seems to be into yeast, okay? So he's going to buy yeast chips, right? And they will have all the genes in yeast. Maybe not even all the genes in yeast, probably all the regions in yeast. Every 25 bases in yeast, he's going to probably have a distinct probe for right? <coughs> Maybe all the different common, you know, for humans though, if you want to try to use it for understanding something like human disease, you would probably want a different chip. And so you can imagine here a company where they probably, wherever, they will make chips for anyone, you promise to buy a couple thousand chips from them, they will be happy to buy, you know, to make, make one to your specification, right? I don't know what the couple of thousand, you know, what, what the break-even point is. But the point is that for all popular species, for all common uses, you would probably expect to get, uh, be able to buy an Affymetrix chip for it. Any questions about that? Okay. So this is really kind of an amazing thing. And there are other ways of making these things, again, since we get on the roll. The other one that, uh, that is very interesting, and in fact, I noticed that by the barcode on this thing, this thing was actually not spotted by a robot. This was actually made by a, the equivalent of an inkjet printer. There's a company called Agilent, okay, which used to be part of Hewlett Packard, that makes, that makes arrays basically using the same technology as an inkjet printer. People remember inkjet printers? What do they do? They would squirt a precise dot of ink at the page, right? Obviously, they could squirt small dots because if not, you just got a big glop of ink on your page, right? But what if instead of squirting ink, they squirt something that said knock the block off the cap, right? And then squirt it in A, right? So if imagine if instead of having your, Agilent, your inkjet printer, instead of buying a cartridge that had red, green, blue, you bought one that had A, C, G, and T, with an also a, no a block knocker offer, right? You could imagine squirt here, knock a block off then squirt an A, right? Then move over one, knock a block off, squirt an A. Does that make sense? And then you could print these things essentially using an inkjet printer, okay? And that's really what this kind of a slide was, okay? 
And what's neat about this is that you could do this now to make, they do the same kind of basic growing. But what's neat is when you print out your picture of yourself to send, you know, print, print out the homework assignment on your inkjet printer, you didn't have to print out a million of them, right? You print out one on an inkjet printer and it would be fine, right? So with this, you can basically build your own, design your own custom array for your own particular thing. So if you are the only person in the world who happens to be interested in, you know, uh, name a species, you know, um, oak trees, okay? <coughs> you could build a special microarray for oak trees, okay? Just for your own needs, okay? Any questions? Yeah? Why wouldn't a inkjet printer be considered a robot? An inkjet, okay, so why is an inkjet printer a robot? I would call an inkjet printer a robot. The difference between this and the first one I said is from the, we were starting from sample to put on, okay? Here we're just synthesizing it, okay? You see what they did, but I agree with you, an inkjet printer is a robot, okay. okay? But recognize that what the robot is doing is different. Here the robot is completely responding to a program. You're telling it what pattern of ACGs you want to do it, right? With the other robot, what you're doing is you're giving, you're given a library of test tubes and you're telling the robot, take the stuff from these big test tubes and put them in little dots, okay? So that's, that's, that's the difference between the two methods, right? One, in one case you can spot however a bigger piece you want the other methods you synthesize in your probes are length about 25, right? Any questions about that? Okay. So these are really amazing things, okay? And uh, it's, it's it, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, it's amazing to me that you can build these things. There's all kinds of interesting uh, issues, all kinds of interesting algorithmic problems, which I won't get into, in how you design these things, okay? So that, that, that's a fun thing if you're an algorithms person. And um, all kinds of interesting patent problems that come up because some companies have patents on some of these things. And so, um, you know, you used to for a while, they were, you know, you could only buy certain kinds of, uh, um, what do you call arrays in certain countries that didn't respect other companies', countries patents and stuff like that. So it was a complicated business. But bottom line is, with these kind of arrays, we can now think about detecting whether a piece of RNA hybridizes, okay, for hundreds of thousands of probes in one experiment. Any questions about that? And our limitations are basically what probes do we want to design and what can we do with it? So it becomes a question of using the imagination here. Any questions? Okay. So let's go back. What can we do with these things? Now that you know how they work, I claim we can now start to talk again about what, they, what we can do with them before we start talking about ma algorithmically what are the problems that really come up in analyzing them. Okay? Um, we talked last class in some detail about uh, the idea of ID clustering genes based on similarity, right? So, um, so here we had a world where we had a row for every gene in an organism, okay? A, a, a column for every gene in an organism, a row for each of a different microarray, each experimental condition we run. Right? And then we want to cluster the genes by similarity. Because if we figure out that there are two genes that go on and go off in similar, in similar times, they probably do similar things, or they're probably regulated more like more. They're probably regulated in the same manner, okay? And that's something that's interesting to know. So, if you want to know what a gene does, if you can figure out what other genes behave the same way as it, that's interesting, okay? Any questions about that? So, that's one of the things that's going to motivate the clustering problem when we talk about, okay? Here, what we now have, I'll talk about clustering a little bit later. I mean, by, by, you know, 15 minutes from now, I'll talk about clustering. Each gene here represents a, um, what you call it, a, let's say if we have 15 arrays that we use, it's a 15-dimensional data set. For each one of the, for that gene in each array, we got a value of how much was it turned on or turned off, a number, right? 
how much stuff stuck to the uh, to, to the hairs, right? And based on that, now we're going to be interested in which vectors of expression are the sa similar. That's where the clustering problem comes in. Any questions about that? Okay. Fair enough. What other things could we do? One other thing that we can do here is let's look at some of these other things where um, maybe clustering comes up. Clustering problems also come up in this application. Okay? Let's say you want to try to figure out, I think I mentioned this last time, want to figure out um, the difference between cancer cells and normal cells, right? You could imagine a world where you take a bunch of different patients. These guys do not have cancer. These guys have cancer, right? You figure out for every gene in them, you measure how turned on or turned off that gene is, right? What we would kind of like to think is that there are certain genes <coughs> that are going to be turned on in the non-cancer cells but turned off in the cancer cells. Certain other genes might be turned on here and turned off in those samples, right? So starting to think about trying to detect patterns in this matrix, okay? How do you discriminate these from these, okay? Is a perfectly reasonable, it's clearly an important problem, right? And gets into some of the kind of clustering and data analysis issues we'll talk about today. Any questions? Okay. Um, what other things are there that are interesting that you can do with these things? One thing you can do is to figure out what makes different tissue types different, right? We sort of have the image that if you have a brain cell, this is a brain cell, right? I have, what is a brain cell? That's a brain, right? This is muscle, right? We kind of have the difference is that there's a difference between brain cells and muscle cells. Does everybody agree with that? And then in this class, you're hopefully going to get brain cells and not, or reinforced brain cells, but not muscle cells, right? What is the real difference between them? It's not the DNA that's in them, because every one of these cells has exactly the same genomic DNA. Does everybody get that idea? The difference is that certain genes were turned on to make protein brain cells and certain genes are turned on to make protein cells and it would be interesting to know what the differences are right so you can imagine experiments where what you're going to do is take a large number of brain cells and a large num you know samples of brains and samples of muscles for each gene you're going to look to see how turned on were the genes in the, in the brains and the muscle cells the differences are probably interesting. Does everybody agree with that? And this starts to get at the question of why are different cells different? What makes one cell different type of cell different from another cell? Any questions about that? Yeah. A gene is turned on. In, in our say case, the way we say is that the RNA is being transcribed. That is really what I would say is the simplest way to tell. Okay. So we sort of have this idea, that's, an, that's kind of the, an important point. We have this idea that DNA goes to RNA goes to protein, right? It turns out that the copying doesn't always happen for all genes, okay? Remember, things have to sort of bind upstream, if we think about it. We had this image that here was the RNA, here was the gene in the DNA, right? Something had to sort of bind up here to start the copying process, right? Only when the right things bound did this copying process start, right? So if you want to turn on this gene, somebody else has to make the stuff to turn on this gene. And that's why measuring how much RNA you get measures how much activity that gene is getting at this particular condition, right? And you can kind of imagine that there are probably proteins you need in the brain, in certain types of brain cells, that you don't need in muscle cells. Okay? And so you would expect that, that these genes would not be turned on in the muscle cell, but they would be in the brain cell. Yes, that's it. Right. For tran for use a transcribed RNA. Exactly right. That would be what we would be doing in all this, in 
this experiment, how much is the gene turned on and off, how much different types, also going back on the cell cycle thing that we talked about before, that would be using transcribed RNA. Okay? Any questions? And all these are kind of of the type of things that we would use clustering on, okay, to, you know, in some vague sense. So when I talk about clustering, that's the reason. There are other experiments that you can do that involve not so much clustering and getting expression, but getting sequencing. Suppose, let's say, we wanted to figure out, okay, a good example has to do, suppose, I, I've said in here that every one in, of you being human, you probably agree in all but about one one-thousandth of your genome, right? But all the variation in this room is therefore a function of that one one-thousandth of your genome, right? And it would be interesting to know exactly what DNA differences are there between me and you. We're different in some way, right? We're going to die of different things, okay? There's going to be different diseases we're susceptible for. There's all kinds of different characteristics. How might we measure this? Well, it turns out that a lot of the changes in genomes tend to occur in certain spots. So if we sequence a lot of people, we may learn that in this particular base, half the people have an A and half the people have a C. But almost everybody has the same upstream region and the same downstream region, right? What if I now take this 25-mer and synthesize it as a pro or its reverse complement as a probe on the genome, right, on, on a microarray, and then poured your genomic DNA over it? Does this make sense? If I have a probe that has a, 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 a T in the middle, the, the, the DNA patterns with the A are going to bind here. If I have a probe with a C in the middle, okay, I mean, not a, uh, uh, corresponding an A and a T, a, a G in the middle, the genomic DNA with the C in the middle would bind to it. Does everybody get sense like that? So by using two probes, knowing that this is a place where people commonly differ, okay, in that one position, I could now take your genomic DNA and use that to figure out which one of these two sites you have. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. So if I know that the human genome consists of a lot of places where there are single base changes, common, okay, common single base differences among people, I could build a microarray with all the common variants on it, okay? and then figure out for you which kind of variants by, by running your genomic DNA over that microarray. I could figure out which one of your, you know, your, your basically which, which of these versions, they call these things SNPs for single nucleotide polymorphisms. Polymorphism means change difference, right? There are a lot of places where there are single base differences common in, spe in people, okay? The claim is you could build an array that would tell which, for each one of these common variants, which one you have. And then you could use this to, in some sense, get a genotype, not quite a full sequencing, but a lot of sequencing data about you, okay? Any questions about that, okay? So you could think of this as being millions of genetic tests on one chip, for any place where there's common changes, we could figure out what is it that is interesting about you. Any questions? How many of you I started interested? How many of you ever heard of a company called 23andMe? Okay, why have you heard of 23andMe? What do you know about 23andMe? Basically, I, I think that's where they sequence um, basically your DNA in life. Right. So you can send 23andMe basically a uh, you know. You can, you, you send them a thousand dollars and a uh, Q-tip with uh, skin cells from your, you know, you, you stick a Q-tip in your mouth and scrape some cells off or something like that. Send them the Q-tip and the check, okay? Don't forget either of them, okay? Because <laughs> they won't do it. Then what, what they will do is they will run, they will extract the DNA from the Q-tip, right? And then run it on a microarray like this. 
to figure out for each one of these SNPs, okay, each one of these common variations, which one is it that you have. Then after you do it, they will email you back a, uh, a, a uh, login, where you can go log in to read about your genomic DNA. And you'll say, oh, what do, you know, you can browse your own genome and say, oh, what is this? Oh, look, you have a 30% elevated chance of getting cancer, okay? <laughs> you look over here. Oh, look, you have a 20% higher chance of alcoholism, okay? <laughs> By looking at the variations here, you can now figure out, customize what is your variant and what is known about the phenotype from these variants. Okay, yeah? I heard that <coughs> you get your whole genome for 20,000. Okay, 20,000, come to me, I can get it for 1,000, okay? <laughs> no, for, t for 20,000, the vision is maybe you can get the whole thing sequenced the way we've talked about in class, yes. pretty much, you know, by actually running it through a, a high-throughput sequencer or getting these 25 MERS, all the 25 MERS, and then trying to assemble them, okay? Here, what you're doing is getting something that is um, less information but cheaper, right? At the places where people have seen variants and know that there are common variants, they will tell you which one of those variants you have, right? So this is less information than the entire sequence, but it is in some sense more reliable to get, okay, by this. It's cheaper to get. And this is by definition where there is the stuff that people know might have some kind of impossible medical implication, right? Because these are the spots that people have studied that there's no, there's something that there might be interesting at this spot. Okay? So undoubtedly, you will be sequenced at some point, perhaps in this manner, perhaps in the, you know, full genomic sequencing. And we'll see how the technologies evolve. Yes? Yeah. You're saying, ah, what you're concerned with is what happens if I have a 25 mer? where there are three SNPs, right? You're saying that, that if, the G, if the SNPs were very close to each other, things wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to design, uh, let's say that each one, this could be an A or a T or a C or a G or an A or a C, okay? I couldn't tell which one of these you have. I couldn't build one probe to tell whether this is an A or a T because I don't know what the other ones are, right? Well, if, if, if that's a problem, big deal. I'll design all eight of these probes and then I'll sequence all three at once. Does that make sense? If the SNPs were repetitive, meaning that sometimes here it was a case that, that some people have an A and other people have a run of three A's. That's what you mean, right? Uh, I mean, so you have a single nucleotide change at the beginning and a similar nucleotide change at somewhere down the line, but, but both of them have a similar set of... Oh, you're saying what would be the case if, if my differences were? If you said it was an interesting case that I had an A here and a C here and they were 50 bases apart. Is that what your concern is? Well, that's not such a big concern to me. We'll use one probe here to figure out whether you've got an A or a C here. Another probe here to figure out if you have a C or a G here. And if maybe you're saying if you have both of them, it means you're going to... Uh, okay, so what you're saying is the concern that you're worried about is what if there was a 25 mer in... That if the SNPs occurred in a 25 mer in common then I might be in trouble. But 25 MERS, first of all, are pretty long relative to random chance, right? So 25 is usually long enough to be informative, okay? I could see where, you know, there are pathological cases where it might be hard to figure this out, okay, from just 25 bases. But the claim is there is enough to figure out to keep companies like this, you know, to make this an interesting technology. No, so they reduce they reduced the cost from 25 to 10? The answer seems to be no. I guess 25 seems to be about the right length. And there are other issues where if you make the thing too short, you w everything's going to hybridize to it, right? Under almost all conditions. And so, you know, so anyway, so this is enough. You can, you can find a lot of good 
get a lot of information from one of these. Maybe not absolutely everything, but enough to be almost everything. Okay? Any questions about it? Okay? So recognize there's lots and lots of different things to do with these things. Maybe uh, I want to get into clustering a little bit today. But uh, there's lots and lots of things you can do with these kind of assays. Maybe I'll talk more about a couple of other things next class. Yeah. So your best thing is, are these interesting SNP regions distributed evenly around genomes? OK? The answer is probably not. But well, OK, so what, it, what I think what you mean is, first of all, the genome is really broken, as I usually don't talk about, into 23 chromosomes, right? That's where the 23 in me comes from, right? The 23 part comes from. These things have numbers, chromosomes 1, 2, 3, let's say. It is not true that all chromosomes do not have equally interesting information on them, OK? So you might very well imagine that certain chromosomes might be rich in variation, while certain other chromosomes tend to be not very in, in, rich in information. One of the more boring ones, I believe, is someone who knows can correct me, but I believe is the male sex chromosome. Okay? There's actually very little in the way of genes on that kind of thing. Okay? You know, it's, it's life, okay? But, uh, but so it, the answer is that certain chromosomes would have a lot. Some of the others might have less variation. The point being I can build an array to contain all the interesting variants, okay, and check that, okay? Any questions? Okay? Yes? Um, all genomes, only 2 or 3% is really genes. Only, we said that only 2% of the genome is genes. That's right. So SNPs happen in junk area too, right? We could do the math on this. And let's see what the math of this means if we really want to think about it. The genome we said was about 3 billion bases, right? What is 3 billion? That's 3,000 million billion, right? Now, how much of this, if we differ in one out of every 1,000 bases, OK, where are the potential SNPs? The number of SNPs are now on the order of about 3 million or so, right? Not all of which are known or of, in, of interest. But that gives you a ballpark figure that says, yes, if you give me a chip with a, with a million-ish probes on it, I can hope to do something for all of those SNPs, right? Now, but this model will say that if the SNPs were randomly distributed, then you would expect that um, 98% of them would be outside genes, right? And the answer is a lot of the SNPs do lie outside genes. Are they important? Are they not important? I will say, in general, they're probably less important than the ones that lie in genes. But there's some that are very important. You know, we talk about genes as being the protein part. There is an upstream region that determines whether a gene is being turned on or not, right? Things have to bind upstream to start this process, right? So these signals of where it binds are very important, OK? And so there's probably a lot of variation in the upstream regions of genes, not so much the protein that's being made, but the control region that's determining whether it turns on or turns off, OK? Right? Because let's say I need a particular DNA signal to have a protein stick here, right, to turn on the gene. If I change one base over here, this protein won't stick anymore, right? And now the gene won't get turned on. That's something that is obviously a pretty significant change that might happen with one little base change, right? So bottom line, there's a lot of places where there are going to be changes. Many of them don't matter. A relatively small number matter, but a small number of a very big number is still a big number, right? But not so big you can't capture it in a microarray. Any questions? Yes? Ah, okay, so now what you're asking, there's a question here about how good does the match have to be in order for things to bind? This gets into questions of how accurate is the binding and what kind of sources of error are there, OK? And the answer with anything that you're dealing with molecules, molecules are small. All kinds of horrible things 
can happen, right? So here we have a string of length 25 that is a pattern, right? Sometimes something that shares 24 of 25 might accidentally stick as well, right? You kind of picture that there's an attractive force. Um, a lot depends upon the strength of these bonds, okay? And so the, the strength of the bonds depend upon what kinds of things. The longer the molecule is binded, bonds, the stronger it is, right? So we talked about these spotted arrays where you had thousand, you know, 2,000 bases stuck down, right? You could really separate something where, you know, 2,000 bases stuck from something where only 1,000 bases stuck, okay? It turns out that there's different phenomena, like the strength of a binding between an A and a T and a C and a G turns out to be different. One of these bonds is twice as strong as the other, right? So the question of will 25, 4 of 25 strong bonds be stronger than 25 of 25 weak bonds, the answer is yes, right? So there are all kinds of issues where it also depends upon where the mismatch happens, right? If I have two things that bind except for one base in the middle, that turns out to be a weaker bond then if I have two things that bond except for at the end, right, they go separate ways at the end, that's less disruptive than if you have a mismatch in the middle, okay? So the bottom line is that, you know, they, they try to make these hybridization things as accurate as possible. It is a mess. There's going to be some mistakes. There's going to be noise in here, okay? And the goal is to do the best that you can with the no you know, to combat the noise. One way you can combat the noise is to, instead of using your million cells to determine a million different genes, you may say, hey, wait, humans only have 25,000 genes, right? Why don't I instead take a million divided by 25? What's that? What's a million divided by 25? 40? Why don't I instead use 40 different probes for each gene, right? A different 25 more for each 40 different 25 mers that occur in each gene. And now I look and say, well, if 39 out of these 40 probes stuck, that probably means I've got a lot of the gene there, right? And if only tw 10 of them stuck, well, maybe that doesn't mean the gene was turned on. Does that make sense? So there's su there, we have to recognize that there are sources of error. There's lots of potential error problems. You're dealing with molecules, but there is so, so we're going to have to, we're not going to expect perfect binary data from this, right? But the hope is that by adding redundant probes, by designing our probes as carefully as possible to maybe select the one that is most unique to this gene. And so if there's some mismatches, it's less likely to stick to anything else. By doing the design in the right way, the claim is, you can get pretty good results, okay? Any questions about that? Does that make sense? One interesting example of a design problem, again, and then I promise I'll move on to clustering, has to do with um, what they call self-hybridization. What happened if you had a piece of hair, okay, A, 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 and at the end of the hair it was a T, T, T? Does everybody see this? If this is a molecule and it's free to wiggle around, if it's long enough and free to bend, and it has a self-complementary sequencing, right? You can expect that it's going to stick to itself before it gets a chance to stick to anybody else, right? And so this is a very bad thing to try to do. You want to make sure that there's not a sequence and it's reversed complement embedded within any one of these probes, okay? Any questions about that? So recognize that there's complicated and interesting design issues in making these things. But the bottom line is, for every one of these genes, for every point we're interested in, we can get a somewhat noisy probe of how much turned on or turned off it is, okay? And this now yields us a million data points from an experiment. And the question is, what do we do with it? Any questions about that? Okay, any questions about how these things work? Okay, 
So let me start to talk about the algorithmic problem of clustering, because that's really, I would say, the, uh, you know, there's all kinds of interesting issues in here, but uh, for now, let's talk about clustering. Okay, so clustering is the algorithm, algorithmic problem of um, taking elements where there is some description of these elements and grouping them into, um, you know, into, into classes based on similarity. Okay? Actually, clustering is sometimes put under the category of what I think they would call unsupervised learning. Sometimes this is a buzzword, supervised. Supervised learning. Where the key is the un, okay? You're given as input, okay, a bunch of points, a bunch of examples, and the question is find what the groups are, okay? If you had somebody teaching you something about the groups, that would be a supervisor, right? There would be a teacher that might say to you, oh, this is, see these things, these people are called men, okay? See this, these are called women. Instead, what we are doing is we are given a bunch of different examples of things, and we want to group them by similarity and say, oh, look, you know, all these people, they, they, they all seem to have beards, okay? That may mean this is, we've discovered some kind of a, a group, right? And that group, oh, we'll call them men, okay? So clustering is something where we are just given data, and the question is try to figure out what the natural groups are, okay? Any questions? Clearly it's an important problem. It happened, we saw it in the yeast data, to try to figure out what genes were co-regulated in the cell cycle, okay? If we wanted the group, uh, um, what do you call it? The different discover different disease classes, right? I give you a lot of cancer types of patients. What different subtypes of cancers are they? There you're clustering not the genes but the arrays based on what the genes are. Expression is, okay? And so clustering is a, an interesting algorithmic problem. The first claim about it is that it's ill-defined, okay? that the number of clusters you get depend upon what I will say is somewhat of the eyes of beholders. So here I have a bunch of points, about, oh, about 100 points, in two dimensions. There's an X dimension and a Y dimension. How many clusters are there of this data set? I want everybody to come decide to themselves how many clusters there are, and we'll take a vote. How many people see three clusters? Okay, about half the people see three clusters. How many people see, what is it, uh, nine clusters? Okay, a bunch of other people see nine clusters. Who else sees something else? Does anybody else have another number they see? Okay, you saw how many? What did you see? Six. six. Okay, what are your six clusters? Which six? Uh, the upper, upper bound, there are four little clusters. And you say four, uh, you say six. One, two, three, four. Okay, so notice that the question of how many clusters there are is an ill-defined problem. Does everybody get that idea? Okay, that doesn't mean that it's a meaningless problem. Okay, it depends upon, let's say, what kind of, depending upon what your application is, what kind of clusters you end up getting. Okay, depends upon what, let's say, your meaning is, what your data is, properties there are. Okay, so recognize that it's both important and well-defined. Okay. Again, it happens throughout biology. We talked about um, grouping genes by similarity, um, uh, samples by basically what tissue type and disease. When biologists talk about clustering, they almost always think about these clusterings with respect to trees. Like again, when I showed you the clustering example over here. When you scratch a typical biologist and you say, oh, show me your clustering, they will naturally think in terms of some kind of a tree here, specifying the structure of the clustering or how it was built. This, I claim, is sort of an artifact of certain algorithms, okay? We'll talk about different algorithms for clustering. Some of them, agglomerative clustering algorithms, naturally are described by one of these trees, but other kinds of clusterings aren't, okay? And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of interesting approaches to try to get clusterings out of it. Any questions about that? About what clustering is? Uh, why is it ill-defined? Let me uh, see if I can get next. Boom. 
Okay, so the first thing that you need, if you're going to cluster points based on similarity, you need to have a notion of what does it mean to be similar. Does everybody have that idea? We talked before about, so if we think about the, um, let's think about the microarray problem that we had before from the cell cycle problem. For each gene, the claim was that I had 15 different microarrays, right? And I measured it at each of uh, 15 time points. That's gene 1. This is gene 2. Okay, I got a bunch of numbers here. This was a 6. You know, each one of the, the 15 uh, in the first array, this gene was an 8. Then it was a minus 3, a 2, a 6, a 14, a 1. This one was a 7, a 2, a 4, uh, a 3, a 10, and a minus 3. Okay? The question really is, how similar? How do we measure the similarity or the distance between these vectors of numbers? Does everybody get that idea? Before we try to cluster them, we need to have a notion of when these vectors are similar and when they are not similar, right? And this gets us into the question of what do we mean by a distance metric? Again, we talked about this same problem emerged in string edit distance, okay? We can compare two things by either a distance, okay? If we assign a distance between two things, distance measures that make sense to us are metrics. They have the property that the distance between two things is always greater than or equal to zero, right? They have the property that they're the zero if they are the same. They have the property that the distance from me to you is the same as the distance from you to me. Okay? And finally, if they're well behaved, they obey the triangle inequality. That the distance from x to y directly is always less than or equal to the distance from x to some other gene z, and uh, plus the distance from z to y. Does everybody get sense? If you satisfy these properties, you are a metric. And that's kind of what we intuitively think distances should be. Okay? So if we think about geometric clustering, we probably want distances to be, have the properties of distances that we think it should be. Any questions? Now, the most important distance that I think people are familiar with is the Euclidean distance. Okay? What is the Euclidean distance? We would take each one of these dimensions, okay? In this case, there were 15 dimensions. We would compare the ith value of one point x with the ith value of y, another point y. Compute the distance, difference, square it, sum up the squares of the differences between the values, okay? And take the square root of it. And that was the Euclidean distance, okay? Any questions about it? Now, what is, is this a good or a bad distance measure? Yeah? Okay, so what you're saying here is, so we think about what you're, com you're saying is, if I had, um, you're describing something that wouldn't be captured by this. You're saying in your world that um, you would say that if you have two things that are both zeros, they are, it's important that they both be zeros. Okay, so according to you, you're saying that perhaps by the Euclidean measure, if this dimension was zero and this was zero, there would be zero distance between them. By this measure, a one and a one, there would be zero distance between them. You're saying in some applications, this might be a more important thing than another. Okay? If that's true, I'm not convinced right now of why that would be, in, you know, of applications like that, although probably there are. But 
that would certainly not be captured by this Euclidean distance measure. Okay, we agree with that, right? It would be happily saying that these two are the same. Why do you have this particular issue? Is there some application in your mind where this is true? Okay, so you're saying that if turning on, both genes being turned on meant something more, was a more unusual thing, you, maybe you'd want that to, meant that to be a more important thing, phenomena, than those two not being turned on, okay? I can sort of see now what he's saying here. Does this make sense? We want to now compare in what way we are the same, okay? Let's say I want to compare in what way we're the same. What you're saying is that if two things have a feature in common, you want to reward them more than if they just don't have a feature in common. If you're saying that there's relatively few features, okay, you want to um, reward more for the bigger value. That's right now what I'm hearing you say. Is that right? Okay. That may not be completely captured by the clustering algorithms I'll talk about next, like agglomerative clustering and k-means. But what I'll say is a weird constraint like that might be captured by the graph clustering algorithms I'll talk about a little later. So let's just file that one away before I ask any more questions. Okay, so the question is really what is the distance metric, the influence of the distance metric, okay? If we use the Euclidean distance, we take the square root of the sum of squares, okay? Now, one property of this is it weights all features equally, okay? Now, your concern is a little different than mine. What might be a problem with weighting all features equally? Yeah. Um, well, for example, if you're doing, like, regression or something of that sort, um, or maybe I'm going for the wrong, wrong thing now, but, I mean, so you might want to weight something more uh, because you might want to penalize them more, you know. Okay, you might say certain features are more important than other features, okay? So let's say that we know that, uh, let's say we get information about people and you want to cluster them by similarity. Let's say we have their height, their weight, and their toenail size, right? One argument might be you know a priori that you're not less interested in toenail size, right? Right now, the toenail size dimension would be weighted equally, right? So if you know that certain features are more important than others, that is a weakness of the Euclidean distance thing. Does everybody get that idea? Yeah. Well, there are a lot of different ways you might deal with things, okay? But let's just first recognize problems, okay? We, we only have 10 more minutes. Let's just think about problems that might come up here, okay? What other problem might happen with Euclidean distance, okay? Certain features might be more important, okay? And if I don't know that, in, if I know which features are more important, if I just use Euclidean distance, that information is lost. We agree with that, yeah? One problem you have is that some features might be numerical, not numerical, right? What might be a way you would deal with this? So let's say what's a feature it's not, you know, a people that's not numerical. Gender is a good one, right? Some people are male, some people are female, right? How are you going to capture the Euclidean distance between that? Okay. Any ideas? Okay. There's one idea someone might come up with. Which Well, we want to convert it to a number is what it would seem, right? So, yeah? One, zero, zero, you say what, what is zero, one is zero, and one is one. Does everybody agree with that? This seems to solve the problem, right? Because now, if two people are the same gender, the distance would be zero. If they are different, the distance would be one, right? But does this solve the problem in general? What if you have more than one classes? Let's say that instead we now look at hair or eye color, right? 
You've got eye colors. What are the eye colors? Blue, brown. What other kinds of colors do we have here? What? Green. Red, okay, whatever it is, okay? <laughs> the claim is now when you've got multiple classes now. Suddenly there's no way to number these things, it seems to me, where the difference between the numbers makes sense particularly. Does that make sense? Now you may say I could certainly assign it a number, right? Zero, one. But is the distance between red and green would be five. Is that really different genetically than the distance between blue and brown? Okay? So dealing with non-numerical values is a problem here, right? If we start reducing this to the points and dealing with uh, dimensions, we have to be aware we've got issues with categorical data. Okay? Any other issues with this, what the, what the metric is? Yeah? It doesn't uh, take into account the, for example, if you're looking at uh, expression levels, so one might be overexpressed, one might be underexpressed, but if you're comparing it to uh, the standard, you don't know whether it's higher or lower if you're just subtracting and squaring the distance. Okay, so what you're saying here is, okay, a little bit about, okay, so there's a question about, he, this gentleman knows about microarrays. And one a way to say it is, what if your one problem with this is um, maybe the interesting relevance you're trying to say is not how big the difference is, but whether one is turned on, expressed more than usual or less than usual, okay? So, or to put it in another way that I want to say, there are some problems, I claim, some, some treatment to your data before you do the distance at all that might matter. One thing you could do, let's say we took a look at what your height was, right? People's height is what? Your height, if we were measuring you in inches, people in this room probably range between 59 inches and uh, I'm going to guess 70 inches, okay? Another way that we could, we, that's one way to measure in height. That's height, right, in inches. How do people weigh in pounds? Some people in here, I think, probably range from, you know, 100 pounds, I'm going to guess is the lightest, to the heaviest, I'll say is 250 pounds, okay? That might be a big difference, right? One thing to note is, and what if we looked at something else? The, the one thing to note is that the sum of the, 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 the sum of the square differences here makes a difference depending upon what feature you're scaling on. Let's just let me say this again now, right? Let's say that instead of measuring your height in inches, we instead converted it to millimeters, right? Now this would be fifty nine hundred and seven thousand. Does everybody agree with that? The difference between your height and my height in millimeters is now in, in the thousands, right? The square of it is in the millions, right? Our weight in difference only differs by 50 pounds, right? If we just use the Euclidean distance on that data, what features will it implicitly make as more important? The, the, not the weight, the height. Does everybody agree with that? Because a relatively small difference, okay, ends up accounting for a big difference when we actually look at that. Does everybody see this? If you just take the numbers and, and, and routinely crank out the Euclidean distance, all the dimensions could be measured on a quite different scale, and that's completely lost, right? How should we solve for this problem? This is an important problem. How do we solve for it? You say residual value. We want to normalize. We should normalize our dimensions in some way, right? Both scales should have the same value range. Both scales should have some kind of a value range, some kind of a difference. What is the right way to do it? Okay. The standard way is by doing something called a z-score. Okay. Have you ever heard the word z-score? Okay. What if I replace the value x by x minus the average value of x? right, divided by the standard deviation of those values. Let's think what this would mean, right? 
first, x minus the mean now tells me something about whether or not you are above weight average or below weight average, right? Yes. 